our Redeemer. So I have to start off today with a, a little bit of a, maybe an apology, maybe a begging for some indulgence, because um, I've, I've made a mistake most previous. I've mixed up the liturgical order of the Sundays in Advent, completely by accident, I might add. Uh, today's theme, as you've heard, there's been this theme of joy, where in fact, and that is, in fact, today's theme, but what I'm preaching on today is more peace, which was kind of last week's theme. But if you think about last week and what we did last week and the incredible concert that we heard last week, I think that kind of covered joy. And if you were here, I think your heads are nodding. If you weren't here, you can go back on YouTube. It's, it's up on YouTube. You can see it. Uh, and you will know we covered joy last week. So... I kind of want to cover peace this week. I also saw a really interesting quote this week that really made me think when it came to peace. It was one of those quotes that it kind of disturbs what you expect of peace, but got this feeling there's something really deep and profound and maybe even right about this quote if you can actually figure out what it's getting at. I, I know it showed up on my Facebook feed, but I don't know from whom. I check my usual sources of people who post this kind of stuff, and it wasn't on any of their timelines. The quote goes, You cannot truly call yourself peaceful unless you are capable of great violence. If you aren't capable of violence, you're not peaceful, you're harmless. Important distinction. And it's, it's one of those ones... I kind of had a feeling about there, there's something in that, but at the same time, peaceful and violence, those, those seem to be opposite ends of the spectrum. I don't know how those are going together here. Our reading from Isaiah today talks about an heir of David. Of course, we assume that that heir that Isaiah and so many others were talking about is indeed Jesus, who is descended from the line of David. As we listen to some of the ways that Isaiah describes this heir, we certainly hear strong echoes of Jesus. We certainly hear something that is very Jesus-like. And we hear that this future heir will be blessed with the Spirit of the Lord. God will be guiding this heir with a spirit of wisdom and discernment. And that seems like someone who's going to understand everyday life and be able to make good everyday decisions in how to live everyday life. A spirit of counsel and strength points to someone who is able to build communities, and as, as Isaiah might have expected, a king who is both gifted diplomatically, but also militarily. And finally, a spirit of knowledge and reverence of the Eternal One is what our reading today said. Uh, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord is what other readings might say. But overall, this talks of this future ruler's piety. That this future ruler will be following God, will base everything that they do on God, and everything that God has taught. Sounds kind of Jesus-like, doesn't it? We go on and we hear that this heir will be just. That they'll judge by more than what they see and with more than what they hear. So that even if the opposing counsel is really tricky and really able to weave words and make convincing lies, this future heir will see what is true, will see what is real, and will judge according to that. And again, this sounds very much like Jesus. This sounds like the king who reigns in heaven. There'll be no privilege with respect to class or any sort of social standing or, or your bank account, none of that's going to matter. This king is going to judge according to what really is. But then we get into some
something kind of not Jesus-like. And it's a little disturbing that the earth will shake with his breath, that with a word he will destroy evil. Ooh. Now hold on a minute. That doesn't exactly sound like the Jesus we read about in the Gospel. I mean, sure, he challenged people, but he didn't really speak a word to destroy evil. Hmm. Not very peaceful, a little bit more warlike, a little bit more like what King David would have been, but not Jesus. And in fact, as we read on in our reading today, we hear about the future kingdom, and that certainly sounds like Jesus' kingdom, where the ox and the lion are going to lay down, the lion's going to eat hay, where a little child will be able to stick their hand in a cobra hole, or a toddler stick his hand in a nest of vipers and not be harmed, and I cannot tell you how much I hope that day is today, because I got a toddler and he would do it. <laughs> Once. So I hope that day is coming soon when it's not going to happen. But we, that sounds very much like Jesus. The whole thing sounds very much like Jesus, except for that one little bit about with a word destroying evil and making the ground shake. And ooh, ooh. Isaiah introduces us to this ongoing character of the suffering servant. And a lot of theologians think that that points directly to Jesus as a suffering servant. That Jesus, we see that in his life. He didn't live a life of great wealth or high social standing. He was challenged almost every step of the way. He ate with poor people, with sinners, with tax collectors if there was no one else. But a servant of God who suffered. And in fact, even on that last night, when the authorities came to take him and his Disciples were ready to fight for him. And he says, no. This is what has to happen. And he submits to the power of the world. That sounds Jesus. That sounds like what we're expecting. If Jesus had said, well, you might come to arrest me, but watch this. Get out! And everyone had fallen down. I mean, that wouldn't have been too much like Jesus. And this, it makes me think again of that quote, that you cannot truly call yourself peaceful unless you're capable of great violence. If you aren't capable of violence, you're not peaceful, you're harmless. And it's an important distinction. But then, you think about it. Jesus as the Son of God. Well, there's a lot said about the Son of God and what the Son of God can do. And we heard about the Son of God outsmarting authorities and escaping and evading capture before. On that one night, he chose not to. He chose to allow himself to be arrested, knowing where it could possibly lead, and ultimately did. That peace that he comes with, the Prince of Peace, is a choice. It's a choice to be peaceful. And I think that's what the quote is getting at, that you have to choose that peace. Or maybe, maybe it's as uh, Shane Claiborne puts it, peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. <coughs> It is the act of interrupting injustice without mirroring injustice. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. It is about a revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressor free. This is what
what Jesus chooses to do. He is interrupting injustice. He is disarming evil. He is finding a third way, a way that doesn't side with anyone but God, because it's God's way. Jesus has these incredible abilities, and yet he chooses to use them to lift up God, to glorify God. And if you think about it, we all have incredible gifts. One way or another, we're all gifted with something. And we can use that gift to glorify ourselves, to lift ourselves up and say, oh, aren't I so good? Look at how skilled I am. Ultimately, though, you find that when you lift your gifts up, when you use your gifts to lift yourself up, it leads to violence. It might not be a rock and sock battle, but it does lead to cutting yourself off, lifting yourself up at the expense of someone else, battling to get ahead somewhere when you use your gift to glorify yourself. But when we follow Jesus' way, Jesus' way of glorifying God with his gifts. Never using it for his benefit, but using it for the benefit of the gospel that he was sent to proclaim. When we do that, then we find peace. We find that God gives us the gifts as a community to ensure peace, to interrupt injustice, to disarm evil, to find that third way that isn't fight, it isn't flight, but it's the arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. This is what God has given us. And as we stand in between two worlds, the coming of Jesus and the coming of Jesus, we use our gifts Whatever those gifts may be, gifts of leadership, gifts of skill and crafts, gifts of just being welcoming, we use those gifts to build communities, to build communities that lift up and glorify God, not individual people in the community. And it's when we do that that we are able to challenge the world and to show the world, look, there is a better way out there, a way where there aren't winners and losers, there are just children of God, honored for that image that is stamped on each one of us, that creative image that cries out to love and be loved. It's when we challenge that desire to glorify ourselves, that we challenge the world. And when we are glorifying God, it is a choice. And it's a choice to make peace. A choice to keep peace. A choice to keep the God who is love at the center of everything that we do. And then we create that world. That world where the lion lies down with the calf, where the bear and the oxen are eating together, where there is no danger on God's holy mountain because knowledge of God, knowledge of love, spreads out and fills the entire world. And we've all been given gifts to make that kingdom a reality. Each one of us. And in this time, we prepare for Jesus' coming. We think about what those gifts are. And we think of ways that we can use them to lift God up, to build that kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of love, and a kingdom of peace. Let me pray for you. God of peace, it is so tempting to use our gifts for our own benefit. We give thanks that you have sent us Jesus, who shows us how to use all of the gifts that you give us 
for your glory. And we pray, God, that as we go from here, we might hear your Spirit showing us what those gifts are, and we might see how Jesus used them, that we may use them in our lives in the same way, to lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.